All right. Awesome. All right, great. Well, thank you everyone for coming. I uh, appreciate it. I'm going to be speaking about stablecoin collapses and specifically what you can do to prevent them in your protocol design. So my name is Nate. I go by Eat Sleep Crypto, and uh, I'm the founder of Token Dynamics. I've been in the space for 10 years now, and I've been writing about token economics and related concepts, how to value cryptocurrencies, where currencies get their value from, and how to financially engineer value into your token in a way that aligns the incentives of all of the participants in your protocol. Um, that's what we do at Token Dynamics. So it's tokenomics as a service and protocol design shop. And I want to start by talking about why Bitcoin captured my attention and why stablecoins have my attention now. So when I first found Bitcoin, my friend told me about the Silk Road, and he told me people were buying drugs and other illegal things over the internet, and I asked him, what currency are they using that this thing hasn't been shut down by the U.S. government yet? At this point, Silk Road had been going on for two years, and I was fascinated when I found Bitcoin. He's like, oh, there's a network and some miners, and I was an information systems major at the time in college, and so I started to look into this and realized that this protocol and this currency had legs. And what initially attracted me and still attracts me to this day is that Bitcoin survived because of the economic incentives. Bitcoin is primarily an economic innovation, not a technical one. All of the components for Bitcoin existed, predated its launch for at least 10 years. Proof of work, other components of Bitcoin had been around for a long time. It was Bitcoin's alignment of these pre-existing technologies coupled with the economic incentives that have kept it alive under fire from so many governments and large corporations that would rather it not exist. And so for a little bit of context on my talk today, I'm going to be focusing on the economic exploits to protocols rather than the technical exploits. I'm going to distinguish what that is, but for now the term is economic security. And I'm going to be focused on what everyone calls decentralized stablecoins. I prefer to call them censorship resistant stablecoins because decentralization is a means to an end and not the end in itself. Just because your protocol is completely decentralized doesn't mean it's going to work, doesn't mean it's going to be valuable or hold up under pressure. But if it's censorship resistant, by definition, it will. And part of that is because censorship resistance is the only unique value proposition of blockchains and blockchain-based applications. There are other ancillary points, but mainly censorship resistance is what gives these things value and makes them so different from existing technologies. So I'm going to be talking about that, and I'm going to be going through the history of exploits of particularly stable coins and give you guys a couple examples and try to sum them up into categories of ways that protocols, specifically stablecoin protocols, have been economically exploited in a way that gives you a way to think about your protocol design. I'm also going to leave you with some essential questions that you need to ask in your design process to make sure that your protocol doesn't get economically exploited. So economic security is uh, I define it as a lack of bugs in the incentives. Technical security is a lack of bugs in the code. And economic security can also be described as the alignment of incentives in a protocol that allow it to be sustainable for the long term without human intervention. So without trusted third parties or something like a DAO that wraps your parameter adjustments and keeps it just alive enough to persist. Um, and I have Charlie Munger up here because he is a uh, big inspiration for a lot of my work. Uh, he didn't actually say code is law. He probably thinks Bitcoin's as bad as his partner Warren Buffett does. But Charlie Munger has two quotes that I really like and relate to tokenomics and incentives. And that first one is, he says, uh, show me the incentive and I will show you the outcome. And so what we're working with in economic security is a system of incentives that do three things. They're providing value to users, they are accruing value to investors, and they're keeping the protocol sustainable for the long term, as long as they're properly arranged. These are the three principles of tokenomics. I'll get to them later. The second thing that Charlie Munger says is, uh, 
if you have the opportunity to work on anything else, or if you have the opportunity to work on incentives, don't work on anything else. So that's the reasoning behind the economic security focus rather than the technical security focus. And so you could sum this up by saying economic security is concerned with system design rather than the translation of the, or, or rather than the code itself. It's more the translation of your code uh, into your, the translation of your design into code and also the design itself. There are three E's of economic security. These are edge cases, exploits, and externalities. So I'm going to start by going over a couple of vulnerabilities and exploits, collapses that have happened in the past and categorize them. These are a few categories up here that you can lump things into. Um, so we have uh, this GitHub thing here, you can check it out. It's a repo of economic exploits that have happened across all protocols. That's on our GitHub token dynamics XYZ. And uh, on the right here, this is a timeline of the economic exploits of stablecoin protocols. You can see they're kind of clustered around peaks because a lot of the things are um, collateralization underlies a lot of the issues, liquidity underlies a lot of the issues, and these things come up at peaks. So. A uh, couple categories here. The first one, um, dependencies. So this is the logo of Angle, and their stablecoin was uh, used in Euler, which got hacked earlier this year. And when it did, it caused the token to drop drastically in value. Um, the point that I want to make, and something that I reiterate a lot, is economic security is inherited. So when you're designing your protocol, you have to consider what your dependencies are, whether that's uh, a dependency on another protocol or a dependency on your token price. The uh, upstream, the, the consequences of other people's protocols that you build on have downstream effects. The second category of exploit that we see a lot of are governance exploits, and I'm in a, I have an entire slide dedicated to this because governance is the largest attack vector for most protocols, and I think it's very underestimated today. I think going forward, we're gonna see a lot of the older protocols exploited through governance rather than through other system design failures or technical issues. Um, central planning is a third broad category of economic security exploits. We have, uh, that was Fay there, and I have a little bit more to say about that, but when you try to engineer people's behavior, you're going to create externalities, these unwanted consequences that are borne by people who don't necessarily opt in to the um, underlying behavior. So uh, one case of externalities is like phase uh, trying to, phase over-engineering of the incentives in their protocol led to a DPEG and that caused a death spiral for hundreds of millions of dollars of value. Uh, fourth category here that is um, not entirely unique to stablecoins, so all of these categories are not unique to stablecoins per se, but system design. Um, and Ohm is a stablecoin, uh, Olympus DAO, but um, you know, th sometimes there are just fundamental issues with system design, and poor game theory is one of those. So when I first heard about Olympus 3.3, I thought negative 10, negative 10, the prisoner's dilemma, because Olympus DAO and Ohm, the idea that you would uh, you know, not sell if someone else doesn't sell is just a glorified prisoner's dilemma. It has extra boxes in the grid. Um, so sometimes just simple system design issues come up that developers don't anticipate for one reason or another because there's a lot of moving pieces in protocols. And going back. Great. Okay, so um, I want to talk a little bit more about governance issues. So, like I said, governance is the largest attack vector for most protocols. And that's because governance rights don't actually make a token valuable. Um, the uh, analogy I like to use is McDonald's. So, you could meet someone that goes to McDonald's every day for their lunch, and they might see the little slip that says, vote on our next menu item they probably won't check those boxes. They won't go out of their way to do that. They definitely won't pay for the privilege. And this is the situation that I think most protocols with pure governance tokens are in, where their users are not that invested in the future of their protocol because there's no direct incentive to be. 
Um, so you need to capture value in other ways. This is a solution to the economic security issue of a pure governance token. And I have here the logo for Uniswap, fee switches, and the promise to maybe someday accrue value to your token is not a good enough reason to, uh, is not a good enough mechanism to accrue value. You have to use your token in ways that people are willing to buy it. And uh, I wanted to go over two examples here before I move on. So the first is Beanstalk. Um, Beanstalk had a, a system design issue, but it was their governance which immediately voted a protocol, a um, proposal through that was exploited. And had they not had that issue, they might have survived to this day. The second is my second favorite economic ex security exploit, which was build finance. So they had a four or five day voting window where somebody had managed to accrue most of the treasury tokens and they were, uh, it was a large minority, and they were voting themselves the treasury funds. And so you had build finance all over Twitter for almost a week trying to rally their community to vote against this proposal, but they were watching a slow motion train wreck which culminated with the loss of all of their treasury funds. So second uh, high level category here is central planning. Um, so this is mostly concerned with the second order consequences and being able to think through all of those. Um, I actually shy away from even trying to suggest people build complex enough mechanisms that they have to simulate things in uh, agent-based simulations. My thinking is, and, and we do agent-based simulations at Token Dynamics, but in general, if your protocol is so complex that you can't put it to a thought experiment to find these kinds of exploits, it's likely that you're not going to be able to identify all of the agents in the system such that you could model that behavior and prevent the same exploit. Um, and so what I, uh, generally advocate is for market-based mechanisms. So markets are self-correcting and they're maybe the most efficient coordination mechanism that we have as people. And I advocate to include market-based mechanisms wherever you possibly can in your protocol instead of things like um, one token, one vote, which, uh, or uh, I'm sorry, uh, one person, one vote schemes with pure democracy and DAOs or uh, having you know, set groups of people upgrading the protocol, those uh, amount to centralized inefficiencies um, or centralized dependencies in uh, decentralized systems. So in one um, particular uh, thing that I like to talk about is, is the uh, setting of parameters. So you can set parameters uh, in a centralized way, but um, if you leave your protocol you know, uh, sorry, I'm gonna backpedal here. Um, so, hard coding parameters is a problem. Hard coding algorithms is still a problem. So people have the idea that they can sidestep uh, the need to, hard, uh, to update parameters, but uh, hard coding a controller can be just as bad. So we see this in Rye with Reflexor. Rye is uh, trending lower and lower because they've hard coded the controller, even though they have something that's kind of um, mechanistically changing the rates internally in the protocol, it's still a predictable enough behavior that it can be exploited and taken advantage of. We've seen Vitalik even trading Rye and uh, recognizing after recognizing these kinds of flaws in the system. So to sum this up with central planning, it's mostly concerned with second order consequences. Um, this, this liquidity is a unique concern of stablecoin protocols. So there are two fundamental questions here. The first is how do you price collateral assets? And there's this concept of marking assets to market that's borrowed from traditional finance. So mark to market, accounting is where you say the last traded price applies to all of the existing shares of a stock, for example. Um, you know, if Tesla traded at $100, then all of the shares of Tesla are then valued at $100 each. But in, rea in reality, that's not really the case. There might not be all, you know, the entire market cap's worth of liquidity at that price. 
And so um, one important consideration for stablecoin protocols is to properly model this in their, uh, in their uh, protocol design. The second uh, liquidity question that is unique to stablecoin protocols is which assets do you even use? So some of the things that you might think about when you're deciding which assets to use to collateralize your protocol, it might be the liquidity of that token, like we previously mentioned, the stability of that asset, the volatility of it, and how long it's been around, its, its longevity over time. And uh, on the bottom here are a few logos that have different approaches, different answers to these questions. So on the left, some of you that have been around for a while might remember BitShares. BitShares collateralize several different currencies and gold and silver. Um, and so they were solving, you know, they were using the same uh, collateral bit shares for multiple things. They were diversifying in that way. Synthetix does more or less the same thing, but they have a DAO wrapper sort of where people vote on parameter updates. And so it en ends up being a slightly more centralized version of bit shares with some extra longevity. Uh, Terra, obviously, uh, I was going to make this entire talk about Terra and just going deep into that, but I feel like that'd be playing Stairway to Heaven in a music store. So I didn't want to go that route. Um, but Terra was using, Terra actually was like, I won't say it was a good idea, but it wasn't as bad of an idea as most people think because Terra was attempting to do what Synthetix and BitShares did, uh, but for multiple protocols. So uh, Terra itself had an uh, Anchor Protocol, which caused UST, but it also had Mirror, which was um, you know, collateralizing various traditional equities with uh, Luna tokens. So they were diversifying in the same way as the first two. Um, but the two really interesting ones that we've seen stablecoins out of recently are Go and Curve USD. And both of these are moving in the direction that I think um, most protocols are going to move in that they're basically guaranteeing the liquidity of the stablecoins, the underlying assets that are used as collateral because the liquidity exists on their own platforms. And I think the direction we're going to see in crypto is toward an Oracle list design and the referencing of actual liquidity for the backing of these tokens. So Oracles are another consideration and the essential question here is how do you know the price you're getting is accurate? And this boils down to what I call crypto economic authority. This is the quantifiable trust that you can place in any piece of data or module or protocol, and it's calculable. So unlike decentralization, censorship resistance and economic security are quantifiable, and you can look at protocols and almost deterministically find exploit vectors in this manner. And uh, the this fundamental paradigm here with the Oracle question is whether you introduce third party trust to your system. Um, so Chainlink is the de facto Oracle for crypto, but there are many other alternatives. Tellor is one of them. And uh, I'm gonna use an example of a protocol that actually integrated Tellor, but in the wrong way, uh, despite tons of feedback from various uh, teams that, um, that they needed to adjust their system design. But uh, BonkDAO minted, had a stable coin minted, and um, they, uh, this is actually my favorite economic security exploit. So they, uh, someone figured out that they could update the price of an asset to, instead of being worth $13 and change, to be worth $5 billion each, and they deposited that asset uh, into the treasury, so they staked $175 worth of Tellor TRB, uh, deposited that asset into the treasury, and minted the protocol dry. Um, and this is a, a simple fix, but comes from the question of how do you know the price you're getting is accurate? Um, so these are, this is the essential oracle concern. And so all of these questions are the economic security considerations that are particularly relevant to stablecoin protocols, and these are not all of them. You also have questions about the other two principles of tokenomics. So if you're interested in this, check out my ETH Denver talk. I explain demand-side tokenomics and the tokenomics trilemma. 
but economic security is just one of the three principles. You've also got to consider the usefulness, the utility of your, of your protocol to users, and the value that you're accruing to the investors in the protocol, your token holders. Um, and so in addition to the sustainability of the protocol itself, economic security. And so that's what we help protocols consider at Token Dynamics. We have room for two additional projects right now. And if you're interested, you can scan this QR code or come talk to me. This has got all of our contact info. And with that, I'll open it up to questions. Like you quoted from Emin Günsürer uh, regarding the fake stable coin. Like, can you explain what was their major problem? Thanks. Yeah, I forgot to, I, I skipped over Faye. Um, so they penalized, uh, Faye was penalizing users for redeeming Faye. But uh, in doing that, they nuked their demand for their token because people don't want to buy a token that they have to pay penalties on in the case that they redeem it. They had a lot of other, uh, you know, kind of market manipulation, not market manipulation, central planning is really the best way to put it. Because uh, one issue that I see, we see a lot with protocols is people are porting over their reasoning from traditional finance. They're thinking about how it's done in TradFi as an analogy to how it should be done in crypto where they don't maybe have another idea or they're not creating a brand new mechanism. And that's fair. But uh, one of the things that's inherited is this idea of centrally planning an economy because protocols in crypto, crypto protocols are essentially uh, island economies, like nation, island nation state economies. They're small and um, insulated from maybe their uh, other economic counterparts. But, um, and so the, the issue with Fay Protocol in particular was they were trying to micromanage their users' behavior. And this manifests in a bunch of different ways. It's not just the coding in of the parameters to elicit certain behavior from users. It's also issuing tokens as a, uh, an incentive to participate in the protocol can actually be like really detrimental to your protocol because you are focused on a supply side distribution rather than the demand side uh, of your protocol and generating demand for your token. So these are a couple different ways that uh, protocols centrally plan that leads to exploits or vulnerabilities or edge cases uh, in, in different ways. And so Fay Protocol is one example of that. Thanks. Um, I was interested in your point on governance. Um, do you think we're going to see the end of, of kind of governance tokens altogether? <laughs> because as you quite rightly pointed out, there's a number of drawbacks. Thanks for that. I hope so. Uh, I'm a government governance, <laughs> Freudian slip, I'm a governance minimalist. Uh, so I think governance is probably the worst way to uh, change crypto protocols. I think issuing things in an immutable way as a hyperstructure and then iterating on that or building modularly in tandem is the best way to design protocols. It requires a lot more thinking up front and that's where the censorship resistance comes in. That's where, um, you know, that's what we help protocols think about. So I think uh, governance might go by the wayside. The, the steps between here and there are several whales accumulate large, well, first of all, the crypto markets become slightly less speculative and token governance token prices trend towards zero until some large whales come in, buy up a large minority of the governance tokens and vote themselves the treasuries if there are some, um, or change the protocol to their own ends. Something that I didn't mention, uh, but related to governance is if you only have a pure governance token, if, if uh, the ability to change the protocol is your main driver of value in the token, the only people that are going to buy your token are those that 
uh, benefit at the expense of the protocol or potentially at the expense of the protocol because they can make upgrades to um, change your uh, change your protocol to point to theirs, for example. Like, I think we're going to see hostile takeovers of protocols in the future, and that's going to be super interesting from an economic security perspective, but I don't want to see any of the protocols that are securing lots of value suffer those kinds of exploits. Yeah, I know at the end you had said that uh, maybe oracle list protocols or protocols with kind of built-in AMMs uh, on top of them would, would do really well. So do you... Isn't that sort of naturally fragmenting of the liquidity? And like, would you see like one, I guess, taking off and winning? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I think those Oracle list protocols for now are going to start as um, for long tail assets. And the uh, way I see that evolving is that those protocols in particular can become launch pads. So similarly to how Curve. Um, does away with the need for Binance. Like Binance used to be the launch pad for all projects and you had to pay them a hundred grand just to get listed and then you had to give them market making fees or someone market making fees to provide liquidity for your protocol. With Curve, if your token is valuable enough from organic demand, you can use that to bribe LPs to give, ins uh, to give a discount to people trading for your token through a pool. And so the same kind of or oracle list protocols, like Hoyu is one that has an AMM mixed with a lending protocol, um, could be a decentralized launch pad as like a way to gain traction in long tail assets before eventually becoming the main decentralized exchange and lending protocol for uh, all tokens. So you have also mentioned uh, that you don't like baked-in constants or like baked-in controllers, but uh, it seems to me at least that there are no great alternatives to those, right? So either you kind of freeze your protocol and then it's like V1 and that's the end of it, or alternatively you have some governance which then allows to kind of smoothly evolve away from this initial version. So like. How do you square this problem, I guess? Yeah, great question. So um, I think I will use an example of one protocol that is doing this well. Um, the short answer to that is I think everything should be IBC compatible and upgradable and modular. It's hard to think about that in advance. But if you have a roadmap, then it is possible to think about how to design your smart contract so that it's extensible and you can build on it in the future and integrate different modules of various smart contracts from places in the past. And one protocol that's doing this for their next upgrade is Railgun. So they're a privacy protocol and they're building on their own past contracts, but without porting, you know, without a V3 of every contract, they're using V2 from past contracts and upgrading in that way. So building modularly is, I think, the way to do that. It does fragment liquidity for DeFi protocols, but there are various ways to build defensibility into your protocol, even if it's open source and immutable. Like Uniswap has one of the strongest economic moats in crypto. I think it's why their token hasn't gone to zero yet. Um, they have, they do several things very well. They have good developer documentation. They've got great PR. They have, um, you know, a lot of good things going for Uniswap that keep people using Uniswap even when there's one inch and other DEX aggregators that are offering users lower costs. So there are ways to protect uh, your protocol in upgrades and avoid fragmenting liquidity to other protocols in that way. <laughs> 